If Hitler asked you to electrocute a stranger, would you? Probably, by Philip Meyer. Before we begin, I want to recommend that you take the note outline that's attached to the article and rip it off so you can take notes as we read. Let's take the title of this selection seriously for a moment. Suppose that Hitler did ask you to electrocute a stranger, would you? Of course I wouldn't, is our immediate response. I wouldn't hurt a stranger. Just because someone asked me, much less electrocute the person. Such an answer certainly seems reasonable, but unfortunately it may not be true. Consider two aspects of the power of groups over our lives. First, we all do things that we prefer not to, from going to work and taking tests when we really want to stay in bed, to mowing the grass or doing the dishes when we want to watch television. Our roles and relationships require that we do them, and our own preferences become less important than fulfilling the expectations of others. Second, at least on occasion, most of us feel social pressure so strongly that we do things in conflict with our morals. Both these types of behaviors are fascinating to sociologists, for they indicate how social structure, the way society is organized, shapes our lives. But electric at someone? Isn't that carrying the point a little too far? One would certainly think so. The experiments described by Meyer, however, indicate that people's positions in groups are so significant that even nice, ordinary people will harm strangers upon request. You may find the implications of authority and roles arising from these experiments disturbing. Many of us do. In the beginning, Stanley Milgram was worried about the Nazi problem. He doesn't worry much about the Nazis anymore. He worries about you and me, and perhaps himself a little bit too. Stanley Milgram is a social psychologist, and when he began his career at Yale University in 1960, he had a plan to prove, scientifically, that Germans are different. The Germans are different hypothesis had been used by historians such as William Shire to explain the systematic destruction of the Jews by the Third Reich. One madman could decide to destroy the Jews and even create a master plan for getting it done, but to implement it on the scale that Hitler did meant thousands of other people had to go along with this scheme and help to do the work. The Shire thesis, which Milgram set out to test, is that Germans have a basic character flaw, which explains the whole thing, and this flaw is a readiness to obey authority without question, no matter what the outrageous acts of authority demands. This is in your notes, by the way, Shire thesis. The appealing thing about this theory is that it makes those of us who are not Germans feel better about the whole business. Obviously, you and I are not Hitler, and it seems equally obvious that we would never do Hitler's dirty work for him. But now, because of Stanley Milgram, we are compelled to wonder. Milgram developed a laboratory experiment, which provided a systematic way to measure obedience. His plan was to try it out in New Haven, in Connecticut, on Americans, and then go to Germany and try it out on Germans. He was strongly motivated by scientific curiosity, but there was also some moral content in this decision to pursue this line of research, which was in turn colored by his own Jewish background. If he could show that Germans are more obedient than Americans, he could then vary the conditions of the experiment to try to find out just what it is that makes some people more obedient than others. With this understanding, the world might conceivably be just a little bit better. But he never did take experiment experiment to Germany. He never took it to farther than Bridgeport, Connecticut. The first finding, also the most unexpected and disturbing finding, was that we Americans are an obedient people. Not blindly obedient and not blissfully obedient, just obedient. I found so much obedience, says Milgram softly, a little sadly, I hardly saw the need for taking the experiment to Germany. There is something of the theater director in Milgram and his technique, which he learned from one of the old masters in experimental psychology, Simon Ash. It is to stage a play with every line rehearsed, every prop carefully selected, and everybody an actor except one person. That one person is the subject of the experiment. The subject, of course, did not, does not know that he's in a play. He thinks it is real life. The value of this technique is that the experimenter, as though he were God, can change a prop here, vary a line there, and see how much the subject responds. Milgram eventually had to change a lot of the script just to get people to stop obeying. They were obeying so much, the experiment wasn't working. It was like trying to measure oven temperature with a freezer thermometer. The experiment worked like this. If you were an innocent subject in Milgram's melodrama, you read an ad in the newspaper or received one of them in the mail asking for volunteers for an educational experiment. The job would take about an hour and pay four fifty. So if you make an appointment and go to an old Romanesque stone structure on High Street with the imposing name the Yale Interaction Laboratory, 
It looks something like a broadcasting studio. Inside, you meet a young crew-cut man in a laboratory coat who says he is Jack Williams, the experimenter. There is another citizen, 50-ish, Irish face, an accountant, a little overweight, and very mild and harmless looking. This other citizen seems nervous and plays with his hat while the two of you sit in chairs side by side and are told that the $4.50 checks are yours no matter what happens. Then you listen to Jack Williams explain the experiment. It is about learning, says Jack Williams in a quiet, knowledgeable way. Science does not know much about the conditions under which people learn, and this experiment is to find out about negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is getting punished when you do something wrong, as opposed to positive reinforcement, which is getting a reward when you do something right. The negative reinforcement in this case was an electric shock. You notice a book on the end of the table titled The Teaching Learning Process, and you assume that this has something to do with the experiment. Then Jack Williams takes two pieces of paper, puts them in a hat, and shakes them up. One piece of paper is supposed to say teacher, and the other learner. Draw one, and you will see which one you will be. The mild-looking accountant draws one, holding it to his vest like a poker player, looks at it and says, learner. You look at yours, it says teacher. You do not know that the drawing is rigged, and both slips say teacher. The experimenter beckons to the mild-mannered learner. Want to step right in here and have a seat, please, he says. You can leave your coat on the back of that chair. Roll up your right sleeve, please. Now, what I want to do is to strap down your arms to avoid excessive movement on your part during the experiment. This electrode is connected to the shock generator in the next room. And this electrode paste, he says, squeezing some stuff out of a plastic bottle and putting it on the man's arm, is to provide a good contact and avoid a blister or a burn. Are there any questions now before we go into the next room? You don't have any, but the strapped-in learner does. I do think I should say this, says the learner. Uh, about two years ago, I was in the veterans' hospital. They detected a heart condition. Nothing serious, but as long as I'm having these shocks, how strong are they? How, how dangerous are they? Williams, the experimenter, shakes his head casually. Oh, no, he says. Although they may be painful, they're not dangerous. Anything else? Nothing else, and so you play the game. The game is for you to read a series of word pairs. For example, blue girl, nice day, fat neck. When you finish the list, you read just the first word in each pair, and then a multiple choice list of four other words, including the second word of the pair. The learner, from his remote strapped in position, pushes one of four switches to indicate which of the four answers he thinks is the right one. If he gets it right, nothing happens, and you go on to the next one. If he gets it wrong, you push a switch that buzzes and gives him an electric shock, and then you go on to the next word. You start with 15 volts, and increase the number of volts by 15 for each wrong answer. The control board goes from 15 volts on one end to 450 volts on the other. So that you know what you are doing, you get a test shock yourself at 45 volts. It hurts. To further keep you aware of what you are doing to the man in there, the board has verbal descriptions of each shock level, ranging from slight shock at the far left-hand side through intense shock in the middle to danger severe shock towards the far right. Finally, at the very end, under 435 and 450 volt switches, there are three ambiguous X's. If any, at any point you hesitate, Mr. Williams calmly tells you to go on. If you still hesitate, he tells you again. Except for some terrifying details, which will be explained in a moment, this is the experiment. The object is to find the shock level at which you disobey the experimenter and refuse to pull the switch. When Stanley Milgram first wrote this script, he took it to 14 Yale psychology majors and asked them what they thought would happen. He put it this way. Out of 100 persons in the teacher's predicament, how would their breakoff points be distributed along the 15 to 450 volt scale? They thought a few would break off very early, most would quit someplace in the middle, and a few would go all the way to the end. The highest estimate of the number out of 100 who would go all the way to the end was three. Milgram then informally polled some of his fellow scholars in the psychology department. They agreed that very few would go to the end. Milgram thought so too. I'll tell you quite frankly, he says, before I began this experiment, before any shock generator was built, I thought that most people would break off at strong shock or very strong shock. You would get only a very, very small proportion of people going out at the end of the shock generator, and they would constitute a pathological fringe, kind of crazy people. In his pilot experiments, Milgram used Yale students as subject. Each of them pushed the shock switches, one by one, all the way to the end of the board. So he rewrote the script to include some protest from the learner. At first, they were mild, gentlemanly, 
yelly protest, but it didn't seem to have much effect as I thought it would or should, Milgram recalls. So we had more violent protestations on the part of the person getting the shock. Remember, he's an actor. All this time, of course, what we were trying to do was to cr not to create a macabre situation, but simply generate disobedience. We wanted them to disobey. And that was one of the first findings. This was not only a technical deficiency of the experiment that we didn't get disobedience. It really was the first finding that obedience would be much greater than we had assumed and it would be, and disobedience would be much more difficult than we assumed. As it turned out, the situation did become rather macabre. The only meaningful way to generate disobedience was to have the victim protest with great anguish, noise, and vehemence. The protests were tape recorded so that all teachers ordinarily uh, would hear the same sounds and nuances, and they started with a grunt at 75 volts, proceeded through a, hey, that really hurts, at 125 volts, got desperate with, I can't stand the pain, don't do that, at 180 volts, reached complaints of heart trouble at 195, and an agonized scream at 285, a refusal to answer at 315, and only heart-rendering, ominous silence after that. Still, 65% of the subjects, 20 to 50 year olds, American males, everyday ordinary people like you and me, obediently kept pushing those levers in the belief that they were shocking the mild mannered learner whose name was Mr. Wallace and who was chosen for the role because of his innocent appearance, all the way up to 450 volts. Milgram was not getting enough disobedience so that he had something he could measure. <clears throat> the next step was to vary the circumstances to see what would encourage and discourage obedience. There seemed very little left in the way of discouragement. The victim was already screaming at the top of his lungs and feigning a heart attack. So whatever new imp impediment to obedience reached the brain of the subject had to travel by some route other than the ear. Milgram thought of one. He put the learner in the same room with the teacher. He stopped strapping the learner's hand down. He rewrote the script so that at 150 volts, the learner took his hand off the shock plate and declared that he wanted out of the experiment. He rewrote the script so more, so, uh, some more so that the experimenter then told the teacher to grasp the learner's hand and physically force it down on the plate to give Mr. Wallace an unwanted electric shock. I had the feeling that very few people would go, go on at that point, if any, Milgram said. I thought that that would be the limit of obedience that you would find in the laboratory. It wasn't. Although years have gone by, Milgram still remembers the first person to walk into the laboratory in the newly rewritten script. He was a construction worker, a very short man. He was so small, says Milgram, that when he sat on the chair in front of the great shock generator, his feet didn't reach the floor. When the experimenter told him to push the victim's hand down and give the shock, he turned to the experimenter and he turned <clears throat> to the victim. His elbow went up, he fell down on the hand of the victim. His feet kind of tugged to one side and he said, like this boss, zump." The experimenter was played out to its bitter end. Milgram tried it with 40 different subjects, and 30% of them obeyed the experimenter and kept on obeying. The protests of the victims were strong and vehement. He was screaming his guts out. He refused to participate, and you had to physically struggle with him in order to get his hand down on the shock generator, Milgram remembered. But 12 out of 40 did it. Milgram took his experiment out of New Haven, not to Germany, just 20 miles down the road to Bridgeport. Maybe, he reasoned, the people obeyed because of the prestigious setting at Yale University. If he could trust, if they couldn't trust a learner center that had been there for two centuries, whom could they trust? So he moved the experiment to a untrustworthy setting. The new setting was a site of three rooms in a rundown office building in Bridgeport. The only identification was a sign with the fictitious name, Research Associates of Bridgeport. Questions about professional connections got only vague answers about research for industry. Obedience was less in Bridgeport. 48% of the subjects stayed for the maximum shock compared to 65 at Yale. But this was enough to prove that far more than Yale's prestige was behind the obedient behavior. Since the experiments, Sandy Milgram has been trying to figure out what makes ordinary American citizens so obedient. The most obvious answer that people are mean, nasty, brutish, and sadistic won't do. The subjects who gave the shocks to Mr. Wallace to the end of the board did not enjoy it. They groaned, protested, fidgeted, argued, and in some cases were seized by fits of nervous, agitated giggling. They even try to get out of it, says Milgram, but they are somehow engaged in something for which they cannot liberate themselves. They are locked into a structure, and they do not have the skills or inner resources to disengage themselves. The results as seen and felt in the laboratory, he has written, are disturbing. They raise the possibility that human nature, or more specifically the kind of character produced in American democratic society, cannot be counted on to insulate its citizens from brutality and inhumane treatment at the direction of a malevolent authority. <clears throat>
A substantial proportion of people do what they are told to do, irrespective of the content of the act and without limitation of conscience, so long as they perceive that the command comes from a legitimate authority. If, in this study, an anonymous experimenter can successfully command adults to subdue a 50-year-old man and force, him force on him painful electric shocks against his protest, one can only wonder what government, with its vastly greater authority and prestige, can command of its subjects. Stanley Milgram has his problems too. He believes that in the laboratory situation, he would not have shocked Mr. Wallace. His professional critics reply that in his real life situation, he has done the equivalent. He has placed innocent and naive subjects under a great emotional strain and pressure in selfish obedience to his quest for knowledge. When you raise the issue with Milgram, he has an answer ready. There is, he explains patiently, a critical difference between his naive subjects and the man in the electric chair. The man in the electric chair, in the mind of the naive subject, is helpless, strapped in, but the naive subject is free to go at any time. Immediately after he offers this distinction, Milgram anticipates the objection. It's quite true, he says, that this is almost a philosophical position, because we have learned that some people are psychologically incapable of disengaging themselves, but that doesn't relieve them of the moral responsibility. The parallel is exquisite. The tension problem was unexpected, says Milgram in his defense, but he went on anyway. The naive subject didn't expect the screaming protest from the strapped-on learner, but they went on. I had to make a judgment, says Milgram. I had to ask myself, was this harming the person or not? My judgment is that it was not. Even in the extreme cases, I wouldn't say that permanently damaged results. Sound familiar? The shocks may be painful, the experimenter kept saying, but they're not dangerous. After the series of experiments was completed, Milgram sent a report of the results to his subjects and a questionnaire asking whether they were glad or sorry to have been in the experiment. 83, of seven, or 83 and 7 tenths percent said that they were glad, and only 1.3 percent were sorry. 15 percent were neither sorry nor glad. However, Milgram could not be sure at the time of the experiment that only 1.3 percent would be sorry. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. put one paragraph in the preface to Mother Night in 1966, which pretty much says it for the people with their, figures, <clears throat> with their fingers on the shock generator switches, for you and me, and maybe even for Milgram. Quote, If I had been born in Germany, Vonnegut said, I suppose I would have been a Nazi, bopping Jews and gypsies and Poles around, leaving boots sticking out of the snowbanks, warming myself with my sweetly virtuous inside. So it goes. Just so. One thing that happened to Milgram back in New Haven during the days of the experiment was that he kept running into people he'd watched from behind the one-way glass. It gave him a funny feeling, seeing those people out and about their day everyday business in New Haven and knowing that they would do what Mr. Wallace, to do Mr. Wallace if they were ordered to. Now that his research results are in and you've thought about it, you can get this funny feeling too. You don't need a one-way glass. A glance in your own mirror may serve just as well.